Great, so let's start working some of these questions. We have a data sufficiency question. We are a GMAT robot. Let's go ahead and get ourselves set up and read this question really quickly and we'll work this together. We're gonna to work most of these together. Uh, I might give you a couple to do at the end on your own. Great, so the question tells me some information. It's a word problem. I'm gonna break it down into parts. I'm gonna re-represent the question in a way that I can work with it. So if sales tax is excluded, so they're just saying don't worry about adding tax, just crunch the numbers. What is the total cost to buy one pint of brand A shampoo? So we want one A and one ounce of brand B face cream. They want to know how much this is going to cost us. Great, so let's go ahead and look at statement one. Go ahead and look at statement one for yourselves real quickly. So let's translate this and everyone go ahead and translate it in the Facebook embed if you're, and uh, after you've done it on your scratch pad because you should be following along in class with a scratch pad or a notebook that you can copy everything we're doing here so that you get that muscle memory of doing this. It's very important to get have that muscle memory. Uh, if sales tax is excluded, the total cost to buy nine pints of brand A plus three ounces of B is $204. So if we know this, is this enough to tell us what these two cost? What do you think, Jake? Are these, is this enough? Well, you have two variables and one equation, right? We have two variables and one equation because we don't have this number over here. So we don't have two variables and two equations. So. I don't think that gets us there. We have two variables, one equation. We need to know that information for the GMAT, and that's sufficient to let us know that statement one alone is not sufficient. So if we can eliminate one, we can eliminate what else? We can eliminate E. <clears throat> Great. Let's take a look at statement two. Go ahead and read statement two, and we'll work it together. So this looks pretty similar. The total cost to buy eight pints of A plus six ounces of B is 248. Now just taking this information into account, I must ignore this, just taking two into account, do I have enough information to know what A plus B is? Go ahead and tell me in the chat box. Great, we have the same situation. We have one equation, two unknowns. We must ignore statement one for the purpose of evaluating statement two by itself. If we can eliminate statement two for the same reason that we eliminated statement one, the only question left is if together there is enough information. So now we have two equations, two unknowns. They're not the same equation. 3B, 6B, these are not the same equation. If they were, we'd still be in the situation of, two, of one equation, two unknowns. But we have two equations, two unknowns. Together, they are enough. We don't actually have to do the math, which is important to save time. And if we answer, I think we should be correct. Great. So in this situation, we took the words, we created a couple of simple algebraic equations, but we didn't actually crunch the algebra. We just wrote out the information from English to math, and we used our understanding of when equations, uh, when we have sufficient information to solve for equations, which is an issue that GMAT just loves to test us on. Great, let's continue with our uh, examples for today. So, not a data sufficiency. We have some discrete values here. We could potentially plug them in. Let's take a look at the question first. Go ahead and read it and we'll work on this together. Great. 
So again, word problem, lots of information, let's break it down into pieces, manage it as an information management challenge, and get to it. So three different pumps. We have pump one, pump two, pump three. Are set up to drain a swimming pool. They can empty out the pool in three hours, four hours, and five hours respectively. What is the greatest fraction of the pool that can be drained by two of the pumps working together for an hour? So this pump, pump one and pump two, are the fastest at emptying the pool. So in an hour, if they work together, they could get the most out. But let's take a look. So pump three, let's pick a number for the swimming pool. It's not gallons or uh, any other measurement, but it's just a number that sort of lets us break the swimming pool down. So we could say that it was 60 gallons if we wanted to. We could say it was 60 cubits if we wanted to. So let's say there are 60 gallons in the pool. So I can have some real numbers to work with. If it, it, this takes three hours to empty the pool entirely, how many gallons per hour is it doing? It takes three hours to empty 60 gallons. That means it's doing 20 gallons per hour. And if four, and I picked 60 again because it works nicely with these three numbers. For four, if it takes four hours to empty 60 gallons, that means I'm doing 15 gallons per hour. I don't need to even crunch the arithmetic here. The numbers I picked are really uh, uh, nice to work with. And five, I'm doing it at 12 gallons per hour. So. If I put these two together, that's the fastest I can get a bunch out. So 20 gallons per hour plus 15 gallons per hour gives me 35 gallons I can empty uh, in the one hour that they want to know. And they want to know what sort of fraction that is. So 35 of the 60 gallons can be removed. And if we simplify that, divide both by 5, we get 7 twelfths. So on this question, we dissected it, we re-represented the information a little bit more manageably, we picked a value, so this is some, one of the things we do on, on word problems is sometimes we have to pick numbers that, because they don't give us the actual discrete number to work with, uh, and then we figured out the rates for the three of them, we added the rates of the two fastest, and that gave us the fraction that we could pull out in an hour, I think. Let's see. Nice. Great. So, so far we, we, we've covered questions that cover the techniques that we talked about just a couple of minutes ago. So, actually, I'm just going to do this real quickly. Make sure it has as bandwidth as possible. So, we have a data sufficiency question. Go ahead and get yourself set up to work this question. And let's find out if it's a data sufficiency yes, no question. Xavier, Yolanda, and Zeke have a total of $64. How much money does Zeke have? Okay, great. So we know that X plus Y plus Z equals 64. They gave us that. And they want to know how much money does Zeke have? Great. So in statement one, they tell us that Zeke has three times as much money as Xavier, so 3x what Xavier has, and does a quarter as much as Yolanda, and a quarter as much as Yolanda. Great. So is statement one sufficient to tell us how much Zeke has? Everyone tell me in the chat box if they, can, if they know whether. Sta is statement one sufficient to tell us how much money Zeke has? Well, what can I do? I have this equation represented where I know that I can replace 
x with some value of z. If I divide both of these by 3, I know that x is equal to z over 3. So I could replace this value here with z over 3. If I wanted to replace this, I could multiply z times 4, and I know that 4z is equal to y, so I could put 4z here, and I'd have one equation, one unknown. I'd have one equation and one unknown if I did that, and so that would be sufficient to tell me. Great. Now the only other question is if each statement alone is sufficient. Let's check that out. The total amount of money that Zeke and Xavier have is one-third the amount of money that Yolanda has. So Zeke and Xavier equals one-third of what Yolanda has. And if I ignore one, do I have enough information here to figure out what Z is? I don't because I can't really get it down to you know, knowing what one variable is relative to the other ones. We know that Z plus X is one-third y, so we could uh, substitute uh, three, uh, three times quantity z plus x for y, but I'd still have uh, two unknowns in my one equation. So, doesn't help us. Uh, we would need, you know, more variables filled in. So, statement two should not be sufficient. Statement one alone should be sufficient. All right. Great. And if you want to spend some more time with the explanations on these, you can always just do that and spend some more time with those explanations. Great. Let's keep going. We have another question here, another data sufficiency word problem. Everyone go ahead and get it set up and read the question to yourself. Great, so Jane received responses from 75% of the 24 companies who, to whom she sent a resume. So 24 companies, 75%, and that means that she uh, received responses from 18 of them. So 18 responses. Uh, after those first 24, she received responses from every company to whom she sent a resume. And then they want to know what is the total number of responses. So in statement one, we know that Jane sent her resume to a total of 30 companies. And we know that <clears throat> out of after the first 24, she got responses. So she got six responses, so 30 minus 24 gives us that six, so we know we got all six of those responses after the first 24, and we know that she got 18 from the first batch, so we know how many responses she got given statement one, right? This is sort of the word for statement one. So let's hold on to that. The question is, is each statement alone sufficient, or is it just one by itself? Let's look at statement two. Jane received responses from 80% of all companies to whom she sent a resume. So 80% of all companies to whom she sent a resume. Go ahead and work that one and tell me in the chat box whether statement two is sufficient to answer the question, to tell us whether or not um, we know how many responses Jane received. 